welcome back after the break and i will continue with my presentation so we'll move on second william cameron townsend bible translation navigation mission william Cam cameron townsend was influential american missionary and founder of weekly bible translator and summer institute of linguistics his work focused on translating the bible into languages that did not have a written form. He believed that everyone should have access to the Bible in their own language. And when we see the life of Cameron Townsend, he was born in California and grew up in Christian family. He attended Occidental College and later went to school of American Indian in New Mexico. And in 1970, he went to Guatemala as a first mission trip and there he encountered Kichimaya people that, and realized the importance of translating the Bible into their language because they don't have uh, the Bible in their own language and they are finding difficulty to read, to understand. So he found that it is necessary to uh, for that Bible. Townsend noticed that many indigenous people in Latin America could not understand the Bible because it was only available in Spanish or other European language. This experience led him to dedicate his life to translating the Bible into different languages. And also he, uh, he, trained, he trained linguistics, established training programs to equip missionaries and linguistics with the skills needed for translation work. This included understanding language structure, culture, and effective communication. And also he started aviation mission. Townsend recognized the importance of aviation for reaching remote areas uh, where access was difficult. He made the use of aeroplanes, aerial transport. Townsend understood that planes could quite quickly transport missionaries, supplies, and Bible to remote regions. This was particularly useful in places where roads were non-existent in, uh, or dangerous. Uh, also, airplanes helped logistic for translation teams and allowed for faster communication and travel between uh, communities. And also, he trained pilot, pilots and uh, he started Mission uh, Aviation Fellowship in 1945. And we can see uh, that he was a pointer in the field of Bible translation and aviation mission. His belief in importance of making the Bible accessible to everyone in their own language has had a lasting impact on global mission. Through weekly Bible translators and mission aviation fellowship, Townsend's legacy lives on as countless individuals around the world can now read and understand the Bible in their uh, native language. So this was the work of Townsend. And now you will see that uh, Smith Wigglesworth. He was born on June 8, 1859 in Manston, Yorkshire, England, in a very poor family. And he had a very little former formal education and work from a young age in manual labor jobs, including as a plumber. His illiteracy was a challenge for him for ministry. But he, when he was married with a, a, a girl named Polly, who taught him to read, Smith could read only the Bible. He would later testify that it was the only book he ever read in his life. He raised as a Christian home and his grandmother was instrumental in teaching him about God. His early spiritual development was shaped by a number of Christian influences, particularly the Methodist Salvation Army by Moth Brethren. He converted to Christianity as a child and by his teens he was already passionate about saving soul. He regularly participated in street evangelism, focusing on bringing people to faith. Wigglesworth ministry really began to take shape when he met his wife, Polly Featherstone, who was devoted salvation army worker. She was a dynamic preacher and under the her influence, Smith's ministry matured. These are all additional information. 
and uh, when we see uh, vikas ministry took a dramatic turn in 1907 when he was baptized in holy spirit uh, speaking in tongues during a pentecostal uh, meeting in sunderland led by alexander bodie this experience empowered him in ways he had not previously known marking the beginning of the most powerful period of his ministry we can see he believed deeply in uh, power of prayer faith holy spirit to bring about physical healing he traveled ex extensively across europe the united states australia south africa and other parts of the world holding healing meetings revival services many claim to be healed of disease such as cancer tuberculosis blind uh, blindness during his meeting and we can see uh, he mainly focus in god faith he had the faith in god's word and uh, also in healing miracles boldness and authority emphasis on uh, holiness and when whenever wherever he was going there was loud cr crowd was coming uh, in his meeting and there uh, we we were, we can see a uh, lots of uh, uh, work of holy spirit people got healed from many different diseases and also large crowd would gather and many people would experience a spiritual renewal emphasized repentance salvation and the baptism of holy spirit Wigglesworth was instrumental in spreading Pentecostalism in Britain and beyond. So he worked uh, in many countries and uh, he brought uh, revival in every area. So thank you. Thank you, Komal. That was uh, good information that you shared. Thank you for the extra additional content information. Can we give him a clap, please, everyone? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth, uh, you know, uh, mightily uh, moved in all the nine gifts of the spirit. Uh, not only heal people who are blind, lame, uh, with cancer, but also he raised uh, dead back to uh, life, right? And we have his uh, his photo here in you know wall hanging here, uh, evangelist and healing minister. He says, "I'm not moved by what I see or by what I feel. I'm only moved by what I believe." So he believes that God can raise the dead and heal the sick, and that is what he did. And um, he was uh, a, a mighty in uh, manifesting in the gifts of the Spirit. He's written many books as well about the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. So if you are interested, you can read Smith Wigglesworth's um, books. Uh, the next person we have is um, John Blessy. Uh, over to John Blessy. Yeah. So, so hi. Uh, good morning to all. So I'll just share my screen. Uh, just one minute. So, so yeah, uh, it's coming. So I got a three topics today. The first one is the revival in Hebrides Islands. The Hebrides Islands are in west side of Scotland. So in the mid of 1900s, the churches were very reserved and strongly aligned to the religious traditions. Uh, for example, uh, the musical instruments were banned in church and because it was considered as the devil and we have to wear a traditional wears like black shoes and so on. So because of all these issues, the many young people in the islands were stayed away from the churches, no young people attending the churches and that islands were in a spiritually dry state. So in this uh, situation in the year of 1949, a preacher called Duncan Campbell began to speak publicly about the saving power of Jesus and Campbell was an extremely dramatic communicator and also he rejected all the church traditions whatever happening there and he started preaching the love of God and saving power. He got a good image, uh, image among the people over there but uh, here is the main thing there are main two women in this revival, vaccine of uh, uh, this revival. Uh, uh, I think in the picture we ca you can see the Peggy and Christian Smith. Uh, one was 84 years age and completely blind, blind and other is 82. Uh, she is like double bend with arthritis. Peggy and uh, 
Christian Smith had a particular passion to see the young people impacted with the message of transformation and new life. At that time, there were no young people churches, not even one. They began to pray and they got a specific promise from God. That is Isaiah 44, 3, for I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit uh, on your descendants. So they hold on this, uh, hold on to this promise. And one night Peggy had a revelation. The revival was coming on the churches of the father and it's like crowded of full of youth, youth people. So the one night in the November, like after many months in one night, November, a young man is praying like God. Uh, are my hands are clean? Is my heart is pure? But he got he he did not go further. He fell into a trance and uh, like he he fall down into the floor. And suddenly, within the matter of minutes, three other elders also fell into trance and they were like all in the one word that Lord, uh, are my hands are clean? Is my heart is pure? Then God's power was released. And awareness of God gripped the whole community there. In the same days, Duncan Campbell was called to the lead series of meeting on the last day. Even though it was uh, the time was like 11 or 12 o'clock, total like 600 to 700 youth members are gathered in the church, outside of church. And they're like, they're, they're telling like in the same gap, they were, came uh, from the all the dance halls, pubs and all the uh, places they came to the church and they're asking like we want the Jesus so revival has started there and uh, they had more by power of uh, they could not explain in the matter of minutes everyone came there and the Holy Spirit did his own publicity from the next day the many buses are started coming there and people started coming there and uh, don't know what happened how it happened but the move of God started in the small village of Bavas and spread to neighboring towns and continued till 1958 it's about the first revival and uh, the second topic I got is like Jim Elliot he's a missionary in Ecuador uh, you can see in the picture. So Jimmy Lott is from uh, he's, he's from Portland. He was a passionate evangelist and Elliot was inspired from any uh, early age by the examples of Christian missionaries like David Brenard, William Carey and Amica Michael. He resolved to commit his life to evangelism and international mission work. On February 2nd, 1952, Jimmy Lott told goodbye to all his parents and friends and boarded a ship for 18-day trip. Uh, from California to Quito, it's a place called, it's in Ecuador, South America. He and his missionary partner, Pretty Fleming, first spent a year in Quito learning uh, to speak Spanish and they moved to Shandia place called and uh, there there are people we'll call like, like Quechua. Uh, it's a people tribe name. So three years later, uh, many Quechua has become a faithful Christian. So now Jim is thinking like uh, we have to uh, go to the Aukas. It's Aukas is also a tribe name. So the Aukas had killed many Kyochos. So Jim know that the only way to stop the Aukas from killing was to tell them about Jesus. And Jim and four other Equator missionaries began to plan a way to show the Aukas uh, that they were friendly. So one of those missionaries named Na Nate Saint, who is the pilot for them, came up with a way to the lower a bucket filled with gifts and some foods to people on the ground where they are flying above them. They began to, uh, they began, they started to dropping gifts from the, uh, for the Aukas. So they, they also used, used an ample fare to speak uh, friendly in the language Auka praises. After many months, the Aukas also like, they sent back a gift. So they thought it's okay. Uh, they are being friendly. So we can go to them. It means like, uh, Auka, the main person Jim thought that okay, will it's the time to meet the face to face Aukas type. So they they planned and one day what happened? Uh, they're flying, uh, flying over the Auka territory. Nate Saint, the who is pilot, he spotted uh, a beach and landed the plane there. And the Nate Saint walked into the Aukas village and called Aukas to come to play together in the beach. So after two days, I I, I think two days, two men and the came. And they had a good time. And the other day, the two Auka women walked out of the jungle. So these five missionaries are so happy, like they are coming. So they got closer. These women did not appear friendly. And Jim and Pity almost immediately hear, hear their terrifying cry behind them. As they turned away, they saw a group of Auka warriors with their spares of rice and ready to throw. So this uh, main person, Jimmy Lott, 
he have that gun to shoot them but uh, he couldn't do that because everyone had promised that we should not kill anyone who did not know jesus and to save himself for being killed so within a seconds they were all the tribes at, at a time they killed all the five missionaries i just want to show their picture also uh, the five missionaries how they served the tribes and all they killed everyone in that place so after i think two three weeks they got to know uh, they were killed by the tribes so but don't think that operation aka ended there because it didn't in less than two years elizabeth elliot uh, who is the wife of jim elliot and her daughter valerie and the rachel saint the sister of nate's uh, saint were able to move to auka village and many aukas became christians and they are also now friendly tribe missionaries including nate saint's son and his family still uh, living among them in aukas tribe yeah that's about the second one and we'll go to the last last one more is there uh, so she is in dr lillian b amons uh, she is a canadian physician became one of the most prominent healing evangelist in the early pentecostal movement uh, so in starting lillian was surrounded with problems like he is in a drug she is in drug addicted and um, she used to served prostitutes visited prisons worked at, with worked with uh, alcoholics and deal with very social breakdown of people so one day what happened she realized like if i'm taking drugs like this it may cause uh, maybe it will kill me so she thought she couldn't stop that because it's an addiction and uh, she opened the bible she thought like i have tried everything that will power and medicine science and suggestions and all the rest can do but there is absolutely no hope for me unless it lies between the cover of, cover of, covers of this bible after a few weeks she wanted to go to church but she couldn't she felt like the voice of god is telling her to go and get up and go to the church somehow she went and while coming back she felt better than before after this experience with god uh, god through this divine healing they moved to north venpening to do missionary work she served as like doctor and healing minister It means like both spiritual and uh, physical needs and then uh, she uh, yemens for also she is also a prophetic writer she wrote six books published by gospel publishing house and almost 100 articles published in pentecostal evangel and she had served as a physician missionary evangelist author bible school teacher counselor and encourager she touched many countless lives preaching the gospel with a passion and conviction and that only comes from knowing through first hand experience that jesus christ is the great deliverer Amen. What about the learning and application? Yeah, so we can learn many things from these three stories. But personally, I learned it's like a spiritual renewal. Uh, we can learn it's it creates a spiritual re renewal for us after listening. And the second one is it's it it's creating an impact on uh, these missions. So uh, for for the first one, if you go think about the old women, it inspired me like. even though are very old age they they used to pray in the knees for young people so we can learn uh, pray with consist um, consistency and uh, pray with that uh, without any ceasing and about second person so even the five missionaries they know that the tribe is very dangerous but even though they took that step and went and preached the gospel and this third person also she can think like okay she can overcome she overcome the addiction but she went again and she is helping many people she helped many people to overcome the addictions and she wrote many books like yeah. okay thank you john blessy thank you for the uh, presentation and also for the additional content can we clap for him thank you um yeah uh the next person is um uh uh sugat speak slow loud and and clear okay hi everyone uh, good morning uh, uh, thank you ma'am yeah my name is sugat 
praise the lord all of you uh, so i uh, i share about uh, three topics uh, one revaluation uh, revaluation in Argent argentinas uh, uh, Cazon Cazon and an and an his a uh, businessman first uh, after a uh, turned he evangelist and second uh, he Korean revaluation Yogi Cho and uh, Yondo full gospel church and his uh, first uh, his small uh, small church in tent but uh, so biggest church uh, then and third uh, revivals in Argentina Caldona Frondis Frondis and I, I share uh, uh, his three topics first uh, uh, what happened uh, in the early, in the early 1980 Carlo Anuzonda is a businessman become an evangelist and let's a uh, ever evangelist and Argentina he started uh, holding early open air meetings there are thousands of people except Jesus Christ their servers and their meeting were uh, now not only for the uh, num numbers numbers of the people coming the faith but also for uh, so, uh, supernatural events like healings, miracles, and people's begin deliverance from evil spread. And the revelation both together many church encouraged only and a force on a prayer of your nation. And personal uh, story, Kelso Anastonda was a uh, pastor by prophet uh, Personal, he was a businessman who left called by the God of praise. Despite his background, he become now for his uh, powerful crucifix, uh, where people experienced uh, fantasies, healings, and spiritual freedom. He meetings. He meetings were made by the power of the Holy Spirit and equip de deliverance for evil spirit and he, Anaconda he uh, hum humbles began a passion of the gospel we in screwed made his speaking uh, revivals as Argentinians listen uh, power of the until is the prayer Caso in encourage church to come together and prayer revivals this until is the prayer crazy a uh, spiritual and the made the revivalization possible and second god god use anyone yes is the right uh, god use anyone uh, i also uh, see there but god is the uh, good god he, he choose me and you are also choose God is the good plannings are your lives and is a uh, stories show the God has used people for the walk of life you don't have the be a pastors and too long to be both change in the kingdom of God and supernatural uh, works draw people's sings wonders and miracles equity deliverance from evil spirit where keep drawing people of the meetings people came not just of hear the message but experience for the power of god in in their own evils and second uh, 1980 korean revival yongi cho and young indo full the gospel church Okay, his uh, full gospel church. Uh, he in 1958 
what happened in 1958 uh, david yungi cho then a young pastor standard a small tent church in a poor nigbo in seoul south korea this started with the very few peoples and the church uh, church grew uh, replaced by the 1980 in become uh, become uh, Yodo Full Gospel Church, one of the largest congregation in the world, has the uh, 2040. The church has over one million members. The repentance grow was the due of of the few key factors in, included in the story, in effects on the prayer miracles and healings and the power of the Holy Spirit. The church also develops the call group system power of the holy spirit the church also uh, develops of the uh, calls group statement we small group of be believers and regularly along with the large congregation to say to start connected I don't did the use of the uh, medals helping the church uh, reach every uh, every more peoples and personal story there. Yonggi Cho ministry started in the small tents with uh, all were few peoples. Dispense any strong strongers include in a poor health and uh, financial difficulties. So uh, members faithful and for skills on the prayer he he vision explained when i included the idea of the prayer mountains the place the place where people could go to the fast and prayer he sermons of he often in the on the work of the holy spirit healings living a life of faith who presents to and declares deepest challenges along his build a church that won't impact millions okay thank you okay thank you sugat can we clap for him please yes, thank you uh, Moses, are you there? Moses. Moses is to present now. Moses, are you there? Okay. Uh, uh, Shekhar? Shekhar Amrutwar? Are you there? Hello, Shaker. <laughs> Shaker is usually in class. Okay, it's not there. Fine. Okay. Okay, so just uh, go through uh, a few more uh, revivalists and evangelists, and the rest of you can. Uh, make your presentations uh, next week, okay? Yeah. Uh, one. presentations will be useful and helpful yeah sorry i just had to speak uh, a little bit to our in-person students can you hear me now clearly yes can you hear me yes okay okay so just looking at a few more uh, revivalists charles Spurgeon. Okay. anytime we 
change the just yeah. now can you hear me yes okay okay yeah okay so charles spurgeon um 1860 he is known as the prince of preachers and was, uh, you know, uh, uh, was the pastor of the congregation of the New Park Street Chapel in London. And uh, for 38 uh, years, you know, um, he ministered there. He also uh, preached to, you know, uh, 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 he preached from when he was a teenager. And uh, uh, he was invited once to preach, um, you know, uh, at a New Park Street Chapel in London, because when he started preaching as a teenager, he gained a reputation of a good preacher in a year and a half. And then he was invited by, you know, the Park Street Church uh, Chapel in London to uh, preach and teach. And they were so impressed that, you know, uh, they, he, they kept him as their um, a pastor in that congregation for 38 years. And that congregation grew rapidly. Um, and, you know, um, had to, uh, and, you know, because they grew so large, they had to move to another new place to accommodate at least 5,000 and more people. Okay. So the new um, uh, venue accommodated 5,600 people. And we also know that Spurgeon was invited across the nations uh, to preach. And he preached to tens of thousands in London and the great halls in London and also to um, other places in the uh, world. Okay. And um, he was very dramatic in his preaching style. But you know, he was so strong in his convictions, his message was so direct, that it led many people to the uh, Lord, and he did uh, a mighty work for the Lord. That was Charles Spurgeon. And uh, we also have many of his messages now uh, in YouTube. A uh, lot of his uh, messages also available on the internet. Um, so if you want to read, you can read his messages and listen to his messages as well. 1860, uh, D.L. Moody. Um, we, I al we already spoke about uh, D.L. Moody um, uh, last class, so I'm not going to share on that. But he did uh, amazing work among the college uh, students. He also started um, uh, colleges. Um, a seminary that he opened for young women um, and uh, you know uh, after that Mount Hermon School for Boys to provide education for the poor um, and some of his colleges are still uh, there at present today ministering to many young people okay uh, and his mission uh, movement grew and spread to the world to in Europe and South Africa Okay, um, 1876, Mary Selser who was a missionary to West Africa. She's basically from Scotland, um, and uh, she, um, um, uh, you know, uh, as a uh, she went as a Presbyterian missionary to work uh, uh, in the Kalabar region among this uh, uh, epic tribe there. And uh, when she was 27 years old, when she heard David Livingston had died, you know, she was so impressed with his life and she wanted to follow his footsteps. So the age of 28, uh, she, you know, uh, became a missionary. And the Kalabar people believed, this, uh, this group of people believed that if a woman had twins, you know, one of them, uh, you know, had to be a devil. So the twins were left in the, you know, one of the twins were left in the jungle in clay pots to die. And we see that, uh, you know, she was a reformer. She uh, fought against this uh, practice of killing twins in infancy. And um, uh, she served among the Kalabar people for uh, several decades, several years. And she focused basically on evangelism, taking care of the orphans and the uh, children. She also helped in promoting women's rights uh, in establishing social change, uh, education, and also encouraging uh, trade. So we see that, you know, God not only used uh, men, he also used many women, right? Uh, many of them. We see even uh, Smith Wigglesworth, uh, you know, he was, um, you know, from a very small uh, 
um, uh, low brag background, but it was his wife who had such a great impact in teaching him to read so he can read the Bible. And also she was a, a minister uh, preaching and um, uh, teaching um, and how she influenced his life. Uh, that was so amazing. So some of you will be thinking, hey, I'm just a woman, you know, simple, um, maybe a homemaker, not doing anything, but you can just be such an influencer uh, to your uh, to your spouse, to your husband, and to, even to your uh, uh, children, right? Um, uh, we also see um, the revival in the um, uh, in the Herbrides Islands, um, like um, uh, John Blessy had mentioned about um, how you know Duncan Campbell was influenced by these two women who were so older. One was Peggy Smith, 84 years old, was blind, and the other was uh, Chris. Um, uh, Christine Smith was 82 years and she was um, doubled up with arthritis. But in spite of this, these women had such an influential um, uh, power in just praying uh, for the ministry and birthing the revival that happened in the Herbides uh, Islands. And also we see so many um, others like Amy Carmichael, Pandita Ramabai, uh, Fanny Crosby, uh, Ida Scudder, um, right? And then one of them is also uh, Mary uh, cells, right? Um, so women, uh, God can also use us to birth revival and for his move and, um, uh, you know, uh, and bring about reformation uh, in, in, in the areas that he has placed us, okay? Uh, 1878 is William Booth was a, a Methodist um, uh, a preacher. He was uh, from, uh, was a British Methodist preacher and he founded the Salvation Army. Many of them were impacted by the Salvation Army. Uh, it was called Salvation Army in 1878. Prior to that, it was called as the Christian Revival Society, and then it was renamed to Christian Mission, and then finally to Salvation Army. Salvation Army is even uh, present today, uh, do a mighty work. They basically um, involved in sharing the gospel, uh, but also helping uh, in bringing up uh, human humanitarian aid, and also helping the poor and the needy, which is, uh, you know, also working among the alcoholics, the criminals and the prostitutes. Okay. Uh, so during his lifetime, William Booth, you know, um, established salvation in 58 countries. Um, he also wrote sev uh, extensively, composed several songs. Um, and, um, uh, you know, he um, uh, did a great mighty work and Salvation Army is even there present today. Um, uh, and he wrote guidelines for the Salvation Army to approach social uh, welfare. So if some of you are interested in social welfare, maybe you can take a look at, you know, Salvation Army and what they do and, you know, guidelines that help you to also start your own organization if you would want to do that. Okay. Uh, 1885, C.T. Stud, a missionary in uh, China, India and Africa. Uh, he was a cricketer, English cricketer, uh, who gave his heart to Christ in 1878. And, um, you know, he in 1888, he heard D.L. Modi preach, and uh, he was so stirred up in his heart, you know, to share the uh, gospel. And in 1885, he joined Hudson Taylor as a missionary in China. Um, and, you know, uh, he had, he was very rich because he was a cricketer, had a lot of money. But we see that, you know, before he went into full-time ministry, he gave away all his wealth uh, to George Muller's. You remember George Muller started an orphanage uh, to their missions and uh, he just depended entirely on the Lord. Okay. And so he served as a mighty missionary in China, India, and Africa. And uh, he was uh, quoted as saying, you know, some wish to live within the sound church and a chapel bell. I wish to run a rescue mission within a yard of hell. Okay. So what he means to say is some wish to live within the sound church um, means he's saying that, you know, uh, he's expressing his desire uh, for to live a life that is active, uh, a radical service, even in the darkest place on the earth um, and the most spiritually challenging environment okay so he's saying it's the yard of hell that means you know where there is darkness where there is um, the you know it's challenging to work there whether it's uh, you know where it's dominated by drug gangs drug lords or uh, you know alcoholics or uh, 
you know, um, a crime that is very high in some places. He says, you know, um, he's just willing to um, uh, give his life uh, to, uh, to, you know, s preach the gospel. Okay. So he's saying, while others might, what he really meant by his quote, I'm explaining, is while others might seek comfort and safety within the church, be comfortable in the church, just attending church. He start wanted to bring the message of salvation to people uh, where there was real dire need, even if it meant placing himself in great danger uh, or sin. And uh, he basically reflects his fearless commitment to evangelism and self sacrifice okay so that is uh, his whole uh, passion his vision in life be available serve the lord even uh, if with fearless commitment evangelism and uh, self sacrifice even in the darkest and the most difficult place okay uh, Amy Carmichael, a uh, missionary to uh, India, she's basically from Ireland. Um, uh, she wanted to, uh, you know, volunteer in China inland mission, but she was refused because of health reasons. But that did not stop her. That did not disappoint her. You know, she spent two years in Japan and Sri Lanka. And then in 1895, November of 1895, she came to South India, you know, and she never returned back to um, Ireland. And um, she established an orphanage there uh, called the Donavur Fellowship in Tamil Nadu, basically uh, rescuing uh, women uh, or young girls, uh, caring for them. She started this orphanage because they were forced into temple prostitution. Okay, um, And later she accepted boys as well. And she wrote many books about her missionary work. When she asked, when she, when she was asked this question, what is a missionary life like? Uh, Amy responds, missionary life is simply a chance to die, right? So that means she was just willing to give her life up, uh, you know, uh, as a sacrifice just to serve the Lord, uh, just to minister to people, to um, evangelize, okay? And uh, what she started is there even today. And I told you last week that many of them from the Donavur Fellowship, um, many of them come out as missionaries and, you know, uh, as uh, great men and women of uh, God. Okay. 1899, Ida Scudder, um, um, uh, a missionary, medical, uh, American medical missionary in uh, India. Um, you remember her father, uh, John um, uh, Scudder? Do you remember John Scudder? We learned about him. Uh, John Scudder, uh, who came as a missionary to um, uh, to India, page number 44. Um, and we see that he um, worked in uh, southern India. Okay. Um, um, and we see that he spent 11 hours every day just standing and preaching and distributing tracts. Right? Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. My video is gone. Um, I accidentally touched this uh, wire and it went. Okay, I think we'll have to do uh, without the video. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Okay, so Ida Scudder, you know, her father, uh, John, um, audio is also gone. Okay. Yeah, now can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, we're back. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you know, and we know that, you know, four generations of John Scudder, you know, of his family of 42 missionaries were raised up just from that family. 
right? Started off with uh, Dr. John um, Scudder and then four generations totaling of 42 missionaries just from this family. Amazing, um, uh, you know, uh, spiritual legacy that he has left behind. And Ida Scudder uh, is his um, uh, daughter. And so we see that she did not want to become a missionary. Uh, you know, she had no desire. Uh, she went back to New York, studied, but she didn't want to come back. And then when she came back to India, you know, uh, just in a matter of few days, there were two women who uh, died while giving in, in, in labor pain. Uh, they came knocking at their door and uh, they were not willing to have uh, her father, who was a doctor, to come and you know, to give medical help to these women. Um, and so these women died without uh, any medical intervention. And so that greatly moved her and she decided that she would come back as a uh, doctor. And when she came back, you know, uh, she opened the uh, Mary Teber Shell Hospital. And in uh, she started as a small medical uh, dispensary clinic for women. Then she started uh, this hospital. And in 1980, she started a medical school for girls and in 1928 this medical school moved to 200 uh, acre campus in Velour and uh, it was opened to men and women as well in 1945 and it's called as the Velour um, Christian Medical College it's one of the largest Christian medical hospitals in the world and also it is one of the biggest premier uh, medical colleges in um, India. I was just talking to somebody on Sunday and they were um, telling me that, you know, they, they wanted to, uh, you know, get their doctor, daughter to study in a med, uh, Velo Medical College. And so she had taken a whole lot of uh, papers, uh, to, you know, uh, to be uh, photocopied. And also she wanted printouts. And so the man who was, um, uh, you know, doing the photocopy and taking out the printouts was from another faith, um, you know, um, and when he saw CMC, uh, uh, he was uh, inquiring whether she's getting any medical help who was sick. And so she said no, that, you know, she just is trying for a medical seat for her daughter. And so she was telling me that, you know, that man who's from a different way, faith and comes from a, 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 a community or a religion where their faith is very, very robust and strong. Uh, he had cancer and he was getting treatment in Velour. And so he's saying that, you know, in every ward, uh, you know, when they have their assemblies, morning assemblies or um, their worship time, uh, you know, it's all, uh, uh, you know, can be heard in the speakers in the different words. So people are hearing the word of God. They're just receiving the songs. And he's saying that he felt uh, such a different, uh, there was healing that happened yes but there was a totally a different environment he, he said he could just feel the power and the peace of God and I thought that was very very uh, wonderful and uh, a powerful thing because people are not just going there as one of the best um, places in India and maybe even Asia for medical uh, treatment but also imagine just hearing the word of God and listening to um, uh, to God's word and you know and that is just bringing about so much of healing and peace of mind and a assurance in the hearts and lives of uh, people. So this, this uh, man just actually uh, testified. So it's a wonderful work that was started by Ida Scudder, uh, a, a, a lady who came from a different country, you know, adapting to our country, our culture, but an amazing work that God had um, uh, done through her life. Okay. Yeah, we have two more minutes. Any, any questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, so next week we will do all the others, um, you know, uh, we'll continue with them uh, next week. So all of you who are presenting, please be present uh, uh, next week to make your presentations. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Since you were just mentioning about uh, CMC uh, Velour, on Sunday I heard a sermon wherein, you know, Azim Premji, though from a different uh, secular background, uh, had actually donated 500 crore towards uh, CMC Velour and uh, when uh, Vipro, right? CMC, CMC he, foundation is, uh, Vipro, right? yeah Vipro, Vipro. Yes. okay so the journalist apparently asked him why uh, you have given 500 crore only to this one particular thing and there are many other places where people were helping and uh, he asked them uh, five city names and I don't remember those names but those five city names are from North India 
and a very prominent place and they said what is common in that and uh, j- j- journalist uh, didn't know what is common in all those five places in north india so he said some one of them uh, responded it is of an axalite area some of them told a lot of tribes and other things that are there but these are five small districts in five north indian states where the media can't go where the government can't intrude and thing it is during those times cmc uh, medical college had sent a lot of people uh, during the covid times and uh, they had actually b- brought about a lot of you know healing and thing and it is when they did a research from where these people are actually coming it uh, traced back to cmc and that is the reason he had actually given about 500 crore this happened uh, very recently amazing so. thank you for sharing yes uh, azim prem ji is uh, wipro yes uh, a multinational company and amazing work that uh, the doctors at uh, at velo do and it's a wonderful hospital as well ministers healing to many of them yeah thank you everyone we'll continue uh, next week um, god bless thank you thank you sister